non-dual being, the real self, alone is. Being undifferentiated, it does not arise from anything else nor does anything else arise from it. It is unborn, and for it there is no creation, no second at any time. It is realized by self-knowledge, Yet, as the Maharshi frequently points out in his spiritual instruction, there is no second, no other kind of self to realize it. In the inquiry, who am I? to know yourself as you are. The inquirer is the focus, and the inquirer is the answer to the question. There can be no other answer. In the attempt to meditate upon the truth of your own being, the meditator is first and foremost. What is the nature of the meditator? What is the nature of the inquirer? Self-knowledge is non-dual. As Sri Bhagavan points out, there is not one self to realize another self. For your existence is always singular. So then, what is meant by I in yourself? To realize the self, you cannot imagine a standpoint apart from it as your identity. If you do, such imagination is called an ego, and from the ego rises all kinds of illusion and its consequent bondage and suffering. Liberation, which is the natural state, is the egoless state. That is, freedom from such imagination. What is free from the ego is also free from the adjuncts of that ego, such as definitions in terms of the mind and body or the world. Inquire within yourself, who am I? The self is of the nature of being, consciousness, bliss, Satchidananda. There is no second existence or being to know it, no second consciousness to know it. Between the self and yourself, there is no chasm, no gap. If you imagine there is such duality, then inquire into what you regard as yourself. The self will be all right by itself. Inquire into the nature of yourself. If you do so, the false sense of individuality and all the adjuncts, the false definition piled on top of that ego idea, 
will be destroyed, will, be, will vanish, because they are not true. What remains is what has been existing all along. Because it has been existing all along, self-realization, though the only direct experience, is not an event in time. What comes, goes. What is gained is lost. In self-knowledge, what is realized, what you seek to know through inquiry, is something that neither comes nor goes, has neither creation nor destruction, is not gained and is not lost. The Maharshi reveals the truth about being, the truth of the self, which is the very substance, if we can call it such, of self-realization, by silence. Silence, as he has himself explained, is that in which no eye arises, where there is no eye, nor is there anything else. just being. It knows itself. Shankara has said that Brahman alone can know Brahman. That is, the self, real being, alone knows real being. There is no second. Where there is no second, there is no suffering, no fear, no death, just the self-evident reality. Comprehend within yourself what has just been indicated. Inquire within yourself, who am I? Then be sure of your identity being free of the body, your breath included, and everything you think of. The very, the very fact that you notice that you have a great variety of thoughts, some of which are contradictory, yet your sense of existence remains unchanged and uninterrupted, should be for you more than ample proof that your existence is not thought. Remain free from thought. The very fact that you observe the prana or animating life energy, which seems to be connected with your breath, means it is objective to you. You see its changes. What changeless thing sees all those changes? You are not at any kind of impasse. Who are you? I'm not at any kind of impasse. You are not bound. Who are you? You say remain free of thought. That's part of the identity matter that I've been looking at, and uh, I can only hope or gather that uh, being free from thought doesn't mean not having thoughts, it means not being identified with them. And so what I've been looking at is the process of identification and, and how it comes to be that I'm identified with these thoughts that 
Are you thought? Hmm. Are you thought? Are you what you think? Obviously not, but I'm, I seem to be whole. It's almost as though this has focused my, my attention more on identification with the body and with, um, uh, with all these misidentifications. What do you mean it has focused your attention more? More thinking about the body in one way or another. Um, worrying about the body, hoping about the body. Are you the body? I can't possibly be the body, and I don't know why I don't accept that instead of... Uh, the one who says, I don't accept it, is he a body? <laughs> no bodies around here. <laughs> Thinking about the body does not make your existence uh, equivalent to a body. Wisdom, ha wisdom has everything to do with the knowledge of your identity, who you are, in your real being. There is no similarity between your being and the body. You are not bound by a body. The same is true with thought. Clear? Um, I'd love to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> but just runs against your grain to, to do so? <laughs> Certainly you've become more keenly aware of how experiential the knowledge must be. What you think about won't save you when your breath is gone. What you think about will not save you when your breath is gone. What you know is your identity, fused with your existence, remains. There's where you find your peace. There's where you find your freedom. And that does not depend on thought, breath, bodily action, or any state of the body or mind. That is why with all the questions you've ever asked about spiritual practice and self-realization, I've never put any emphasis on the activities of your body or the activities of speech or activities of mind because self-knowledge alone is liberation. Action does not lead to liberation, whether that action be subtle or gross. You can see, certainly, how tentative or flimsy the bodily condition is. It's not something to depend on. Likewise, your breath or the prana, the animating energy. Certainly, a train of thought in one direction or another is not steady. All the while, your existence is steady. You never cease to exist, and you never cease to know that you exist. Abide in that knowledge, free of misidentification. Do not give rise to the confusion that you are something else. And if you have given rise, inquire. And the truth about your nature will become self-evident. Then you see life and death with an equal eye. I still can't get, I know what I'm not, I still can't get who I am. Who you are is non-objective, so how do you suppose you're going to obtain it or get it? 
if you really know that you are not your thoughts, then you'll not be lost in them. If one really knows the mind is non-existent, there is nothing in which to be lost. So the knowing has to go very, very much deeper than right now. Yes. Self-knowledge must penetrate right to the core. There's not much sense in saying, I know I am not my thoughts, but still they bother me all the time. Yes. <laughs> if we really know that what we think we are not, we are neither bound by those thoughts, nor will we continue to conjure up delusive thoughts. But you have seen that outer conditions do not create the mind's suffering. The mind suffers over its own productions. This is what distinguishes a person being in a spiritual direction as compared to being worldly-minded. Worldly-mindedness or extroverted mind means we assume the external things are real, they determine us, they determine our happiness and consequently our sorrow. A spiritually minded person will know that happiness is within, really know that, in which case there's no more a superimposition regarding outer environments upon one's own experience. The world neither gives you happiness nor does it give you suffering. In truth, the world is not even real. The happiness, the reality, and your sense of identity all have their origin in you. Overlook your true nature. Suppose yourself to be something else. You will confound the real and the unreal. Imagine happiness to be elsewhere and suffer consequently. Turn your mind inward. Know the place of happiness. That place is within. Within is the self. So one pointedly seek a knowledge of yourself. If you know yourself, you know reality. And you no longer dwell suffering in an unreal dream. And one pointedly is second by second. Well, I know seconds do exist. Uh, can you help me with one pointedly? When you desire something intensely, you're one-pointed about it, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, see, you're very familiar with this. <laughs> <laughs> to use the example just cited before, if you're out of breath, you become one-pointed. The Maharshi gives the example of a drowning man trying to get to the surface. For some reason, he's not distracted on the way up. <laughs> he doesn't delay thinking, yes, I'll get to that later. He does not think, yes, but I have all these other desires. He does not think within himself, I'm at an impasse. Should I or should I not get some breath and save my life? Nobody has that, idea, that kind of idea. When we see the importance of self-realization, we become one-pointed. When we see the fleeting nature of life and the... Uh, not the possibility, but the fact of death, rather. We become one-pointed. When we see where happiness is, we become one-pointed. When we see the present opportunity to realize truth for all eternity, we become one-pointed. Try any or all of that. If you still have a problem with one-pointedness, <laughs> ask again. This, uh, in ways, is a follow-up to what you had just said. Since returning from Anomaly and Paranatula, I find uh, a real deep desire to intensify my practice. Uh, I find I uh, meditate more frequently, and what I've been doing before the meditation is reflecting on desire for liberation. You've talked about that a lot. I really have not built that into my script. 
but it seems like a very worthwhile way to start and uh, get the focus. Are there other things in practice that are worth doing again to just make in, let this increase in focus bloom? Uh, you've stated the most important. Adi Shankar, Shankaracharya, has stated that of the fourfold practice for realization, you know that as the requisites. The last, the desire for liberation, is the most important. Even though discrimination and detachment and such are so much intrinsic to real practice, he says the desire for liberation is the most important. It is because if you have the desire for liberation, even if you be lacking in detachment, uh, discrimination, uh, tranquility, renunciation, etc., all those things would come to you in due course because of the intensity of the desire for liberation. While if that's lacking, even if you have a very sharp mind for discrimination, you renounce, etc., not much progress will be made. There'll be no motivation. Desire for liberation is important. When we, let's say, use your example, you decide to take some time for meditation. You have to know why you're meditating. In fact, what, the knowledge of why you're meditating, your approach, is as important as the content of the meditation itself. So if we keep just this much in mind, the focus is there. Then the practice blooms from there. The practice is one of inquiry. If you desire liberation, you'll destroy vasanas, tendencies, manifesting as attachment, misidentification, and such. If the desire is there, you'll have the motivation to examine your own mind and unravel it till there's nothing left to it. If you have the desire for liberation, naturally within yourself arises the, the spiritual practice, even on its manifest activities that are suitable for you. You've got the key, just keep applying it. Thank you.